The earthquake has left many lives in ruins. Since mid-August, 160,000 families here have been without homes. Thousands are injured. The hospitals are overcrowded. In the region of Lake Hai, southwestern Haiti, multitudes of people are in dire need of help, and not enough help is available. Tensions are running high. This aid transport is about to be looted. With rudimentary tools and their bare hands, a family removes the last remnants of their house. Ukal and Etiel say they're lucky to have helpful neighbors. But if they hadn't organized the entire effort themselves, nothing would have been done, says Ukal Gianeste. Yes, I need help. I need help. Everything's wrecked. This was a big, beautiful house. Now just a little bit of it's left. We're doing our best. We're clearing everything out. But we need help to rebuild something new here. Now, this room is standing on the ground. It used to be one floor up. The brothers have to move through the ruins cautiously. They owned a laundry, but since the disaster, nobody has come to pick up their things. Etiel was in the house when the ground began shaking. He barely managed to save himself and his mother when everything caved in around them. I don't have the words to say how I feel. It's unimaginably hard. I don't ever want to have to go through that again. I pray to God to give me strength to make it through this situation. Whenever I'm standing somewhere, I have the feeling that the ground is shaking. That isn't normal. It's like pouring sugar and salt together. We're sad, but we're alive. We've lost everything. But somehow we'll have to start over, rebuild everything from scratch, and begin life anew. On August 14, 2021, at 8 a.m., a magnitude 7.2 earthquake struck southwestern Haiti. As soon as the dust settled, people hurried to help out their families and neighbors. Everyone who was able pitched in. But over 2,000 local residents had lost their lives. At least 160,000 dwellings had been destroyed. They hadn't been built to withstand an earthquake of that scale. Maurice Pondejour and his family look through the rubble of their former apartment for belongings, for blankets or cooking utensils anything that could be useful, some things vital to their lives. We're also looking for things like ID cards and birth certificates. We are searching through everything, but so far we haven't found anything. As they work, they're haunted by a constant fear. At any moment, the ruin could fall in on them. And so, Moise and his entire family sleep in front of the house, like many others in Lekai. After everything that's happened, we're living in misery. We have no house, no roof over our heads when we sleep. We're afraid because there are always aftershocks. That's why I won't go inside any house to sleep. At the same time, people here have very little faith in the authorities. Many wonder why no aid has materialized. They suspect the government of withholding aid money and relief supplies. Their nerves are frayed. Enraged residents gather in front of the police station. It won't be easy to calm things down. Feelings are running high. We need tents and we need tarps because we're sleeping in the streets. When it rains, we get wet. We've no protection from the sun. We're hungry and we can't find any water or food. But the police feel simply overwhelmed. 
Only a few smaller aid shipments trickle in, but they don't have the manpower to distribute them or even escort the convoys, says police chief saint amand france Sometimes, relief supplies arrive from the capital, maybe 50 packages, and we're supposed to distribute them when a thousand people are waiting for them. No matter what we do, it doesn't bring any relief. Is it true that nothing is being done? The crisis committee headquarters in Lekai is humming with activity. All incoming aid, including relief from international organizations, is coordinated here. Discussions follow upon meetings. Some complain that things are moving too slow. In the midst of all the turmoil, Thomas Hufkin is trying to put a transport together for the core relief organization. But no help comes without paperwork. The bureaucracy takes time. Of course it hinders things, but it's necessary. If they don't know what's been done, they won't know what still needs to be done. Thomas Hufkin first came here as a volunteer after the devastating earthquake in 2010 and stayed on. The next day, relief kits will be going out to a small town that was especially hard hit by the quake. One major factor slowing down the relief effort is the sheer size of the devastated area, far greater than one small area. And all this here is very mountainous terrain, where access is relatively difficult. We simply can't get everything to 160,000 families in one, two or even three days. That's just not possible. The convoy moves out to Manish, the little town meant to receive the relief supplies. Hardly a wall has been left standing here. 95% of the houses have been destroyed. The town was hit by the earthquake in 2010, the hurricane in 2016 and now another earthquake. And once again, the residents have to rebuild. An aid organization has at least dug a well. Now the townspeople urgently need plastic sheets and food. Both were to be delivered the following day, but Mayor David Prenard is worried that people will start looting. There are aid deliveries coming, and on the way, the trucks are attacked. This is very bad for our community. We need that aid. Thomas Hufchen and the mayor work out the details for the delivery of the sheets and hygiene products. CORE works on the principle of helping people to help themselves. Haitians will take over the organization and actual distribution. Once the details have been discussed, there's nothing more Thomas can do here. We have a list for who gets what. Everyone gets one coupon. For the distribution tomorrow, only those on the list can come and wait and nobody else. I think we got everything worked out today, so we'll be in pretty good shape for tomorrow. It remains to be seen if it's good enough. The convoy heads back to Lekai. At the hospital, there's still more than enough to do as well. Emergency doctor Louis Rechicard has barely had a moment's rest since the earthquake. At first we were all in a panic, but we did everything possible to help. We're very tired, that's true, but we're giving it everything we can and putting our hearts into it. We're doing the best we can. They're no longer besieged with casualties, but people are still coming in daily, suffering terrible pain. And patients are still having to wait on cots or mattresses for a free bed inside. It pains me to see this, not only as a doctor, but as a human being. Any one of us could be in this situation, and to see this is just painful. Every room in the hospital has been converted into an emergency ward. The situation has calmed down somewhat, but many patients with broken bones have been waiting over a week for their operation. The needed specialists are unavailable, as are many things. We need quite a lot of orthopedic materials. That would be very helpful. And we need medications, antibiotics to fight infections, especially after an operation. And we need lots of painkillers. All around Lekai, people are sleeping outside on the asphalt. The lucky few might have a plastic sheet or a roof to protect their beds from the elements. Ukal Janaste has spent the whole day clearing away the rubble of his house 
and has no other place to make his bed but in his car. At the moment I don't have any other choice. We are born to struggle. And now this, this is part of my life. Early in the morning, the food convoy sets out towards Manish. The trucks carrying the plastic sheets and hygiene products aren't ready to go yet. That will have consequences. After an hour on the road, the first big relief shipment actually reaches the little town without mishap. The police keep order. Anyone who produces a coupon will get some of the anxiously awaited supplies. Thanks, a thousand thanks. But the truck bringing the plastic sheets was not so lucky. There were no more police available for an escort. A mob quickly forms and breaks open the first truck while it's still moving. Mayor Brenard is horrified. It's embarrassing. These people have lost their dignity. It just saddens me deeply because this takes away any basis I had for ever asking for help for our community ever again. No appeals to reason have any effect. The mob storms the second truck as well. Neighbors grapple with neighbors. The rule of the strongest prevails, leaving the old and the weak empty-handed. Now some people have 10 plastic sheets and others have nothing. Here I stand. I didn't get anything. I've been waiting here since morning. My hips hurt from so much standing. With the frustration so great, all sense of solidarity is lost. More aid is needed and faster to make sure the situation in Haiti doesn't escalate any further.